أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما من دابة في الأرض إلا على الله رزقها ويعلم مستقرها ومستودعها كل في كتاب مبين وهو الذي خلق السماوات والأرض في ستة أيام وكان عرشه على الماء ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا ولئن قلت إنكم مبعوثون من بعد الموت ليقولن الذين كفروا إن هذا إلا سحر مبين وَلَئِنْ أَخَّرْنَا عَنْهُمُ الْعَذَابَ إِلَىٰ أُمَّةٍ مَعْدُودَةٍ لَيَقُولُنَّ مَا يَحْبِسُهُ أَلَا يَوْمَ يَأْتِيهِمْ لَيْسَ مَصْرُوفًا عَنْهُمْ وَحَاقَ بِهِمْ مَا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد الحمد لله we reach the 12th juz of the Quran and we begin from Surah Hud Surah Hud started off in the 11th juz right at the end there's about five verses of Surah Hud in Surah Hud in uh, the 11th just which, which we did not cover yesterday So that's where we begin from And then we continue into The rest of the surah Which is part of Jews 12 And then Once the Jews Once the surah uh, completes Then it starts with Surah Yusuf And Surah Yusuf then continues Into the next Jews as well So inshallah today We look at Surah Hud And we look at Part of Surah 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 to Yusuf. Surah to Hud. As I said, five of the verses were in the eleventh juz, and the way it starts is Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alif Lam Ra Kitabun Uhkimat Ayatuhu Thum Fusilat Milladun Hakim in Khabir. ألا تعبدوا إلا الله إنني لكم منه نذير وبشير. Again, just like with other surahs, it starts with the alif lam ra, and then it speaks about the Quran. It speaks about the Quran, كتاب أحكمت آياته ثم فصلت. The concept of the ayah محكمة, as mentioned in Surah Ali Imran, some of the many of the verses of the Quran. Uh, muhkam verses They're firmly established They're not ambiguous at all They're very clear So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that This book whose verses Are absolutely firmly established and ratified And then ثُمَّ فُصِّلَتْ مِنْ لَدُنْ حَكِيمٍ خَبِيرٍ Then they've been detailed The detail in there comes all From the Hakim and the Khabir The Hakim and the Khabir The Hakim is the, the wise one could also be used as the judge, but in this case the wise one and the khabir, the all-knowing one. The idea here is that everything in this surah is so clear-cut. It's absolute, there's no doubts in it, no ambiguity, no uncertainty, very clear-cut, coming from the one who has absolute knowledge of everything. And then they still don't get it, they still don't listen. Though in their hearts they know it's right, they still they still refused. That's why Allah then says, Allah ta'budu illallah, so that you do not worship anybody but Him. And then the Prophet says, Inni lakum minhu nadhirun wa bashir. A warner and a glad tidings, glad tidings giver, that's what I am for you. And then there's some promises that are made that if you do istighfar to your Lord and you return to Him in repentance, then He will, he will treat you with many bounties and many, many gifts and, and so on. So let's just understand that this surah is the 11th surah of the Qur'an. 
it has about 120, it has 123 verses. It's a Makki surah, so you, you can expect what the content is going to be. And it has 10 themes, 10 ruku, and 10 themes inside. So it starts off with, as I mentioned, the Quranic, the majesty of the Quran, and saying that both the verses, in terms of the way they've been composed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and also their content, they're absolutely firm and there's no, they, oh, they, they leave no doubt for, they no, leave no room for any doubt. You won't find any contradiction, you won't find any uncertainty, and no discrepancy in there as well. And one of the reasons for it being so muhkam is because it's from the hakim. The word muhkam, hukam, hakam, comes from the same root as hakim. So because it comes from the wise one, the firm one, and the one who does things well. Because when you say do ihkam of something in Arabic, like ahkimhu, you do something with ihkam means you do something with firmness. So it has all of these meanings in there. The other reason for it is quite simple that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our creator. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created man, created everything. He knows their nature. He knows what he made them from. He knows what he made them for. And he knows exactly what they're capable of doing and what lows they can get to and what heights they can achieve. So when it's coming from the one who absolutely knows everything, this is unlike a company that puts out a camera or an iPad or something and then dis discover a flaw later. So then they have to give a patch or they have to do a recall. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no such doubt. There's no room for error at all. He is absolutely hakim. And whatever he does is with proper ihkam. Right? It's absolutely muhkam and completely firm and leaving no doubt. So he knows not just the past of the human, he knows the present, he knows the future. It's all as if, as if it is today for him. It's the same thing for him. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the verses, and then after that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts the discussion, uh, invitation to the oneness of Allah, because it's a Makki surah, it's from the Meccan period, so it's still in encouraging people to come uh, and leave their idol, idol worship and, and so on and so forth. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then mentions numerous, if you look at the next so many verses until the stories begin. So there's, this surah is split up into first lots of dalail, dalail of tawheed, the proofs of the oneness of Allah. It's afterwards, so initially that's what the discussion is and then after that it goes into several stories in quite a bit of detail as well. So we will, we will be looking at that inshallah. Firstly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you look at verse Six, which is the beginning of the twelfth juz. وَمَا مِن دَابَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ There is no dab, no beast on the earth, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is responsible for its upkeep, for its provision, for its sustenance. There's no organization when it comes to the animal world, that okay, there's a welfare system, if some animal is suffering, they're not going to get and so on and so forth, that, 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 that if some is suffering then they can go and apply and they can get some welfare or a benefit check or something like that. It's basically survival of the fittest sometimes in those places but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the whole animal chain, the food chain such that they either rely on one another, the larger ones rely on the smaller ones and so on and so forth or they rely on the vegetation and there's abundant, generally there's abundant unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to perish just like with human beings, then they perish. So that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's system, even when it comes to that. So Allah is saying that very clearly, look, everything is reliant on me. Allah is saying, reliant on me for its sustenance and its provision. Allah is in charge of everything. And He knows exactly what His temporary abode is, what His permanent abode is. All of this is already recorded. Kullun fi kitabim, in a clear book, it's all recorded. Then Allah says, He's the one who created the heavens and the earth in six days. And his throne was under water. The throne was under water. There was nothing else. It was water. According to a hadith, the water was on air. So the water was on air and the throne was on the water. Allah doesn't need it to have... Allah put it on the water, meaning it was floating on the water. It was, it was balancing on the water in whatever way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished it to be. Then Allah created the heavens and the earth in six days. 
Now, when you go into the various different narrations, you'll, you'll find the discussion that there's two days for the heavens, two days for the earth, two days for uh, th these other aspects. We're not, we don't have the time for that, but one of the main reasons of mentioning the six days, and throughout the Quran, there are different days that are mentioned about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing things. And of course, there was no days in those days, and the sun hasn't been created yet. It was created afterwards, right? The sun came after, you know, throughout the process. So then how, what's this concept of days? So that's in our understanding of days. And again, the whole, me, the, the whole symbolism, the whole message in this is that when you do things, do it properly. If Allah willed, He could have just said kun. He could have just desired it, willed it, and it would have happened. He didn't need to take six days. He didn't need to make it over six days. Do you understand? But many of the Mufassirin, their explanation here is that this is actually a lesson for us that Allah is giving, that you do things slowly. You take time, you do it properly. If you do it all together, I mean, I'll give you a simple idea. When I used to see uh, somebody, my father, or anybody painting a wall, and I think, why is he using just a small brush? Get the biggest brush that you can get and just slap it on. Like, you know, why a small brush or, you know, um, uh, especially, you know, like a door, when you're using a gloss on a door. I mean, they use a smaller brush. That you don't use a, for gloss, you don't generally use a roller. That's used for the emulsion on walls. So why don't you just get the biggest brush and just, especially at least do the middle part. That's what I would have done. They said, no, take it easy. Take it, you just, want every, you just want to whack everything out. So take it easy because when you do that, then it's refined. There's a specific, delicate way to do things. You can't do everything with a big brush. Let's put it that way. You can't do everything with a big brush. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us through this and there's a number of other lessons in here, which inshallah you can read about in your further reading. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a number of evidences for the oneness of Allah and how everything relies upon Him and everything depends upon Him. Talking about the various different aspects from the heavens to the earth. However, the problem is that the lament in all of this is the, the, sorrow, the sorrow in all of this is that those people who can see this and a lot of the evidences that are being provided here are from things that you see every day. And that you can't deny, nobody knows the backing of these things, nobody knows the reasoning for these things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is providing all of, these, all of this idea. But those people whose eyes are closed because of obstinacy, because of arrogance, because of stubbornness, then they're just not going to listen to this. They keep denying the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then they, of course, they deny the Qur'an to be the words of Allah. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again... If you look at verse 13, Allah gives another challenge. Now this challenge, today, أَمْ يَقُولُونَ افْتَرَى قُلْ فَأْتُوا بِعَشْرِ سُوَرٍ مِثْلِ There's three places in the Quran where this kind of challenge is provided. Right? And one of them says, this one says that bring ten, verse, ten surahs like this. Ten chapters, even the smallest ten, bring ten chapters like this. We've already read earlier where it said bring one chapter like this. Bring a Quran like it is another one. So that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about it in different places. But of course, they were never able to bring anything like it. They were never able to bring anything like it. Now, Surah Hud, the main themes in Surah Hud, the specific, more specific messages of Surah Hud, is that number one, the first thing it's going to talk about is obviously a distinction between two types of people. One are those people who have their entire focus in life. Their entire focus in life, their efforts, everything that they live for. And may Allah not make us of them because a lot of people are like that, right? Even if they profess to believe, their main thing is just to get the dunya, to acquire more of it. If it's this house, it has to be a bigger one tomorrow and so on and so forth. Their entire moment is spent thinking about this, in discussing it, in going after it, in earning for it and so on. All they're worried about is just comfort of this world. And they're basically forgetting the hereafter. And some people have absolutely forgotten the hereafter in the sense that they've not even concerned, considered it, which means they're disbelievers. And there's others who've actually considered it, they believe they're going to go there, they've got the ticket for it, but they're not worried about it yet. The other group, obviously, are those people who have been denied, divinely guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who use the world, who take part in the world, and, but their entire focus of, or their focus at different varying levels of using the world, of living in the world, eating and so on, is actually the akhirah, right? We just need to increase that, that more of our world becomes for our akhirah. 
That generally happens through good intention, even when we're eating or when we're sleeping. So their entire focus is the hereafter, and that's where you get between, um, you get between verses uh, until about verse 16 or uh, about v verse 15, 16, uh, around that time. And then when you get to verse 24, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then strikes a comparison between them. After detailing the two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ or actually, مَثَلُ الْفَرِيقَيْنِ كَالْأَعْمَى Which is in verse 24. مَثَلُ الْفَرِيقَيْنِ كَالْأَعْمَى وَالْأَصَمِّ وَالْبَصِيرِ وَالسَّمِيعِ هَلْ يَسْتَوِيَانِ مَثَلًا أَفَلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ The example of these two groups that we've just spoken about, the one who are a'ma and asam, they're dumb and blind. They don't speak the truth. They're not dumb and blind. These are not, you know, people with disability of that sort. No, these are people with a spiritual disability. And I guess a khanqa is a, a home for the spiritually disabled people to become more spiritually enabled. Right? So these people are a'ma and asam. Can they be the same as the one who looks and hears the truth and haq? Can that be an equal example? Do you not reflect? So that's basically... All the evidence is mentioned until then. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala switches style, right? Switches his mode and method of explanation. And this is what the Quran does. And this is um, a question that I think I saw in one of the comments uh, of the tafsir. That um, for the person who's reading the Quran for the first time with understanding, one of the challenges they're going to have is the constant movement from topic to topic, subject to subject. Sometimes the subject is the same, but the arguments differ. So it talks about a cosmic argument, then it talks about a microcosmic argument from the human being. It talks about something from history, gives a historical anecdote. Or it takes you fast forward to the hereafter and talks about the Day of Judgment. Or it strikes terror into the hearts by talking about some punishment and warnings. Or it provides the gladness and the joys of paradise, a depiction and a graphic of the beautiful endless bliss of, of the gardens. Constantly keeps moving. And when you get used to the style, then you start appreciating the style. The, the Quran is a genre on its own, if you want to call it that. It does not have, a, there's nothing else like it. That's why when Orientalists have looked at it, there's a German Orientalist called Noldika. He said, what kind of a writing is this? You know, because generally what you're told when you're composing something, if it's not a poem, where you're composing something is that you start off by, in the first paragraph, by telling them what you're going to tell them. Then you tell them. And then you, you put the conclusion by saying you tell them what you've told them. So you tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them what, you're gonna, what you are telling them, and then after that you tell them what you've told them. That's how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be organized like that. But no, the Quran's objective is totally different. It's not what the Quran is there for to tell you a nice story, but it's actually to pull out your heart. That's why there are numerous different types of arguments that you will see, numerous different themes. So it's on a genre of its own. It's a style of its own. It's not poem. It's not, uh, and it's not prose. It's not anything else, right? It's uh, it's it's got a lot of different things, and that's why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala one of the techniques used is to speak about the stories of the previous prophets and what happens with that is it creates variety stories are obviously interesting for people people like stories they they just people just love like stories even if it's a made up story they like it many of movies are made up you know it's made up but you still like it right you get involved in it people even cry at emotional moments right People cry at him, they get angry, even though they know if they just sit back for a while, they'll think, no, this is all made up. It's just the plot. It's just the director's take on this. Right? But that's how people are. We get into stories. So that's why stories are very, very powerful. So that's why sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides a scene of something. Uh, even in the real world, I mean, in the real world, that's exactly what it is. Every day it's a different kind of weather. A slight different, I mean, okay, if you go to Malaysia, it's heat, heat, heat. But it's either rainy or not rainy. So it's still got a change. It's either going to rain or it's not going to rain. You go around the ty types of vegetation that you see. Some is green, some is brown, some is, uh, mashallah, really large, some is small. 
Subhanallah, sometimes you look and there's a hilly area, sometimes it's a low area, it's a flat area. You go to the ocean, sometimes it's calm, sometimes it's blue, sometimes it's green hue, sometimes it's dark, sometimes it becomes silvery, sometimes it takes on the monstrous waves. Subhanallah, you look at, again, you look at the birds, the various different types of birds, the butterfly. I mean, subhanallah, sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold. Sometimes it's autumn, sometimes the leaves are on the tree, sometimes at other times it's shedding, it's morning, it's evening. So likewise, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He does everything and that's exactly how He does it. I mean, studies show that people get bored easily. That's why many videos that they make for entertainment purposes, they never show you the same thing for more than a few seconds because they want to keep people's concentration there. Right? That's why when it comes to the Qur'an as well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in some cases, He is uh, providing rulings, He is giving commandments, He is providing information, He is providing evidences, He is using stories, He is using other accounts, He is giving advice, He is talking about paradise, He is talking about hellfire, He is uh, giving glad tidings, He is giving warnings and so on and so forth. So it keeps moving from one seen to the next and you have to get used to that and you move with that and you start appreciating it because it's very natural it's the way humans are it's the way human humans inherently want things and the quran is written exactly for that purpose so there is no better reading material than the quran for those who want to read it properly and you will never get bored with it you might get bored of me speaking but you will never get bored of the quran so we see exactly this style. We see actually this style very prominently in Surah Hud. We see it very prominently here. So after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the truthfulness of the Quran and some of the evidences for the oneness of Allah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions several stories here. Right? First he stories, uh, mentions the story of Nuh alayhi salam, then Hud alayhi salam, then Saleh, then Lut alayhi salam, then Shu'ib alayhi salam, then Musa alayhi salam, then Harun alayhi salam. And that's how the surah ends, with their, with their story. And the purpose, one of the biggest purposes for mentioning all of these stories is obviously to make people reflect on what happened in the past. Let us not follow them and be destroyed like the way they did. But both, at the, uh, but both in the beginning and at the end, the first story and I believe the last story is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then emphasizes the truthfulness of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the fact that the Quran is a mu'jiza. See, as I mentioned yesterday, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi was known by the people of Makkah that he was unlettered. He did not learnt to read and write, and he did not sat with any teacher. So then, how is it possible? Now, this is something new. I'm going to tell you today. How is it then possible that the Quran comes with such detail, extreme, elaborate, subtle details about these stories that nobody knew about, but they make sense? It's not like he's coming up with wacky ideas that they just don't gel together. No, with a bit of information they did have, this clarifies it and it fits completely in as the truth. So the subtlety, the veracity, the truthfulness, the completeness of the stories, they're just shocked. Like how can anybody have that information? Because they knew the level of knowledge in, in their area or maybe in the world or whatever. So even when people from outside would come, they'd be surprised. Even educated people would be surprised. So they must then, the conclusion must be that this is coming from another source that has recorded all of history, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is one of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings these different stories. So if you see from verse 25, then it's وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ We've sent Nuh alayhi salam, right, to his people. Likewise, if you look at verse, uh, so if you look at verse 49 then, what you'll see there is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تِلْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الْغَيْبِ نُوحِيهَا إِلَيْكِ these, uh, the, the, these are the unseen, uh, the, this is the unseen information, unseen news that we have revealed to you. You would not have known it. There's no way you could have known it, nor your people from before this. So فَصْبِرْ إِنَّ الْعَاقِبَةِ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ This is to tell everybody that this is something totally coming from the ghayb, from, coming from the unseen, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise then, um, you can check this for yourself, verse 110, uh, at the end of Musa alayhi salam's story, uh, towards the end of, uh, in, in, the, in the midst of his story, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again says the same thing. 
We gave Musa a.s. the book, but there was a, they had a difference about it. وَلَوْ لَا كَلِمَةٌ سَبَقَتْ مِنْ رَبِّكْ لَقُضِيَ بَيْنَهُ وَإِنَّهُ لَفِي شَكِّ مِنْهُ مُرِيبٌ and, and so on. So while there's lots of lessons to be learned from these stories of the five prophets, there's also a lot of comfort that's provided because it shows how the people, uh, uh, the, how the prophet and whoever followed him, they stayed fast and eventually they became the successful ones. So this also gives huge amount of solace to the fledgling community of Makkah Muqarrama, where they've been persecuted. They're, they are being persecuted, they're, they're uh, in a disadvantaged situation, they don't know what's gonna happen, but after all of these stories, after all of these accounts, they're given a huge amount of strength with these things. Now, just to quickly go through some of these stories, uh, I mean, you can read them for yourself. Nuh alayhi salam's story has been mentioned in a few different places, but I think here it's probably, be, it's probably the most detailed. Nuh alayhi salam is a very interesting prophet because he lived the longest, right? And, but unfortunately he had very few, very few followers. One of his sons was not his follower. The story is quite emotional in the sense that where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, uh, quoting him that uh, make the boat because everybody is going to be destroyed and you need to take all your believers and the animals and everything and then after that it comes to the part where he says وَنَادَ نُوحٌ رَبَّهُ فَقَالَ رَبِّ إِنَّ بْنِي مِنْ أَهْلِ now his, his son is his family in the sense that he's biologically related to him but he's, he's not a good guy he's not followed and he sees that he doesn't want to com come onto the boat with them either he has all of these excuses, he thinks that he's gonna, you know, he's seen floods before. He says, well, I'll just go to the highest mountain. I mean, there's no, there's no flood that's ever gone to that high. So, you know, I'll escape it. I'll just live, I'll just basically put the hatches down and live through it. And so Nuh I mean, at the end of this just shows this whole tension between, you know, your religion sometimes and your beloved, right? Which could be a fitna for you. So Nuh actually does call on to his Lord and he says, oh my Lord, my son is from my family. And your, your, you know, your promise is the truth. And you're the best of judges. And subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns to him and says, قَالُوا يَا قَالَ يَا نُوحُ إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ مِنْ أَهْلِكَ يَا نُوحُ that he's not from your family. He might be biologically, but your real family is your religious family. إِنَّهُ عَمَلٌ غَيْرُ صَالِحٍ His deeds are not very good. فَلَا تَسْأَلْنِ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ Don't ask me. Don't request from me that for which you have no knowledge. And I warn you so that you do not become of the unaware people. So immediately Nuh alayhi salam, and this is the, the believer. You could be pulled by your emotions, okay? Human beings, you're pulled by your emotions. You just don't let them get out of hand and there's a boundary for them. So yes, you're pulled by your emotions. Your, your, your heart's going to go out for your children or whoever it is. But at the end of the day, Allah's commands must reign supreme. So immediately Nuh alayhi salam says, رَبِّ إِنِّي أَعُوذُ بِكَ أَنْ أَسْأَلَكَ مَا لَيْسَ لِي بِهِ عِلْمٍ I seek your refuge, that I ask you about something that I have no knowledge about. And if you do not forgive me and have mercy on me, then I would be of the losers. Huge lesson for all of us. Then anyway, that finishes. Then the story of Hud alayhi salam comes. And again, there's lessons in there. And then how they were destroyed. And how there's no mention of their, his people in any positive sense. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Thamud. And Salih alayhi salam. And again, uh, the, the discussion there is about the she camel, right? The she camel that was allowed to, that should have been allowed to roam. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent it come out of a mountain. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent, but then they had a problem with it. They, they basically killed it. And then the punishment came to them. Everybody was dis destroyed except, you know, the, 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 the Salih alayhi salam and so on. Then after that, the, there's the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now, in Ibrahim alayhi salam's story, we already read about Zakaria alayhi salam's story, how he got a child at an old age, right? We, we learned that story in Surah Ali Imran, we already learned that story. Now, the, there's another example of this, that at an old age, an advanced stage, at least from, us, from our perspective, and even there, he says the same thing, and his wife, he says, uh, We gave her the glad tidings of Ishaq. And she said, I'm old, how can I have a child? I am very, very old. Ajuz means very old. Right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, right, that uh, they told her, are you, are, you, are you like surprised by Allah's command? Allah's rahmah, mercy and so on is upon you. Anyway, Ibrahim alayhi salam, after the initial 
uh, kind of shock and surprise of the vis angels visiting. Another thing that's told here, in every time you talks about Ibrahim Ali Salam and the visitation of the angels, there's the discussion of him producing some hospitality, providing some food. Immediately he goes and he gets this roasted, you know, he gets a roast. So this is considered the sunnah of Ibrahim Ali Salam to show hospitality. And the way of hospitality is that when your guests come, you don't say, will you have some tea? The, the true hospitality is you just bring it and you place it. If they want to drink it, they drink it, they have it, they consume it. If they don't, then don't get upset. You do your part. Now, we have many issues here. There's some who's like, do you want something? Do you want something? And people are embarrassed to say they do in many cases. Or we bring something and then they must eat it. They must eat it. And if they don't, then some people even swear enough that their wives are divorced if they don't eat it. So people do some extreme stuff in there. Um, there are adab for, for guests as well. Anyway, then it continues on to Lut Ali Salam's story, who's related to Ibrahim Ali Salam. And there the discussion of his, his guys when these angels came in the form of young men, the people who unfortunately uh, were sodomites, they lived in that area, they wanted to go after the angels. And Ibrahim Ali Salam gets worried, but they say, don't worry about it. In fact, sorry, not Ibrahim Ali Salam, Lut Ali Salam. You know, in this rush, rush, rush for one, uh, one hour, one Jews. Sometimes I make mistakes, sometimes I slip. And the other day I called a grasshopper, I meant, and I called it a cat caterpillar, right? So I, I do make these slips of the tongue. And uh, alhamdulillah, I've got good friends out there who uh, basically point them out to me. So I, when, where I can, I will correct them, and especially if they're serious mistakes, then I will correct them, inshallah. So it's nice to have people that look after you like that. Allah bless them all. So now the idea here is that Lut says he's, he's really worried, he's, he's perturbed that how, how that these are my guests these are angels what's going to happen so he knows the people right that they're after boys so he says these are the girls use them you know that this is what they're made this is what is good for you they say we have no interest in that laqad alimta ma lana fi banatika min haqq verse 79 and so on anyway then again they, those people were destroyed and it talks about how they were destroyed the stones were rained down upon them wa amtarna alayhim hijara min sijilin mandud musawwamatan they were all named as well in the rabbik everyone was uh, you know knew exactly uh, uh, it was known which one so they were very smart smart stones right in today's one then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses shu'aib alayhi salam's story now in shu'aib alayhi salam's story the main uh, talk there is about economics and not cheating giving fair trade and then the whole discussion they quite detail all of these his his people saying how can we you know you, you were like this before us before and now you've become like this and does your quran tell you uh, t tell us that we can't worship um uh, sorry your salat does that command us that we can't worship what our parents uh, you know used to worship that we must abandon it and so on uh, you're you're the only clever guy innaka I mean, this is a very interesting part. Innaka la anta al It sounds like they're praising him, but they're actually like questioning, like, oh, you're the only guided per person. <clears throat> you're the only guided one. You're the only one who, who understands this. So then it carries on, and again, their destruction is mentioned. Walamma jaa amruna najayna shu'aiban walladhina amanu ma'ahu bi rahmatina. Verse 94. And that whatever they did, none, nothing, you know, what, whatever his people did, nothing, nothing of that came to benefit him. And they were also destroyed. Then the last story is mention of Musa alayhi salam and Pharaoh. Uh, Pharaoh and the whole uh, tussle between them. And then there's some really prominent verses that are mentioned here that I want to look at uh, quickly uh, because before we move into Surah Yusuf. Uh, a, few po a few verses that I want to point out here that are... Uh, that, that you know you can inshallah go and seek more of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala firstly I'm going to point out to you verse 15 going back to verse 15 Man kana yuridu al hayat al dunya wa zinataha. whoever is just interested in whoever wants just the dunya the life of this world and its adornment fiha wa hum fiha la you know we can provide them that, that, that but they're, they're not going to get anything out of that these are the people who have nothing in the hellfire except hell, uh, nothing in the hereafter except hellfire. Then we move on to uh, verse um, forty-four, which I would spend. I could spend a, one hour speaking about just this one verse, which is verse forty-four. This just one verse of I don't know twenty-something words is considered to be one of the most 
effectively eloquent verses that just have blown, blown, you know, blown away the most eloquent individuals in our history, including the sister of Imra ul Qais, right, and numerous other people of that time, then other really smart, eloquent individuals who knew the balagha and the effective speeching when they heard this verse. Like, wow, it's got so many different techniques in there, even though the words used are the simplest words that you can have, right? So, again, you'd have to, uh, f- for the ulama, if they want, there's lots of books written on that in the Balagha books. But there's, uh, if you want to just look at Nasafi's Madarik, he's got a really good discussion and unraveling and unpacking all of that. Uh, Nasafi's Madarik explains that very well. A number of other tafsiris as well do it very well as well. Then, another verse that I want to point out was verse 102-104 towards the end which talks about where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he wants to pick out a people and seize them he will, he will do it right and uh, then the whole part is to be read which we don't have too much time to do but the idea is that uh, talking about then the day of judgment there's a very prom- prominent verses here verses 106-107 فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ شَقُوا فَفِي النَّارِ now discussing the result of the world and then the hereafter. Those who've been wretched in the hereafter, they're going to be in the hellfire and they're going to remain there forever and so on. But, وَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ سُعِدُوا This is very interesting. Verse 108. Those who will be fortunate. This means fortunate, those who will be successful, they're going to be in the gardens, therein forever, as long as the heavens and the earth subsist. إِلَّا مَا شَاءَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا مَا شَاءَ رَبُّكَ Until, you know, except whatever your Lord wills. عَطَاءً غَيْرَ مَجْذُوذ now, that's if you unpack just those words, Ata and Ghayra Majdud. This is a gift from Allah, a giving from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is endless. Right? And because these people used to give in the world, they will now be giving. They were kind, generous souls. They would give for the sake of Allah. They would give their time. They would give their love. They would give their wealth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give them in an unending giving. Right? And again, that takes much longer to unpack there. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, verse 112. This is the verse which this surah is, being, is known for. In a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa somebody saw a bit of white on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa some sahaba. They said, we see that you are growing older, that oldness is catching up. So you know what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said? He said, no. I... This has happened, this old age, this aging rather, is come about because of Hud and its sisters, its sister surahs. So what do you mean by Hud and sister surahs? What, which part of this surah? I mean, there's very similar things to other surahs, but no, there's one verse in here. And that is verse 112, the verse of istiqama. فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتَ وَمَنْ تَابَ مَعَكَ وَلَا تَطَغَوْ Remain steadfast as you have been commanded. Remain steadfast as you have been ordered. And that is one of the most difficult things. I mean, if you read up on the concept of istiqama, which means steadfastness, essentially, if somebody does become steadfast, it means that they have a karama, a a miracle of divine favor. That is the greatest karama. Somebody walks through the air, if somebody is able to uh, basically be protected from a, a, a burst of bullets, that's a karama. But the real karama is day in and day out, moment after moment, they're on the path of steadfastness. Steadfastness links to everything essentially, right? Steadfastness links to everything. That, what that basically means is... Uh, a person in their aqaid, in their beliefs, they're absolutely not on this extreme, not on that extreme. Right? They're not overdoing the attributes of Allah. They're not overthinking the Prophet وسلم, putting him where he's not, and they're not diminishing him. Likewise, in terms of the akhirah, they've got full understanding. In terms of their akhlaq and character, they don't have shortcomings, they don't have excesses. They're perfectly moderated as far as possible with equilibrium in their character, in their behavior, in what they do, in their daily, uh, daily rituals, they don't go overboard. Right? 
istiqama and to stay fast. Qul amantu billahi thummastaqim. Say, I believe in Allah and then just stay fast. That's your job. If anybody can do that, there's not as many people, you know, who can do it as far as possible, but those who can, then that is the greatest karama. And one of the reasons why it's a karama, it's a miracle of divine favor, is because the person who's going to do that is generally going to be assisted by Allah. He's going to be a wali of Allah. And when you look at the, the Sahih Hadith of Bukhari, etc., where it says that the people who've made a huge effort in the fara'id and then the nawafil, they've become so close to Allah, then Allah becomes the hands by which they touch, the feet by which they walk, the eyes by which they see. Basically, they're now being divinely guided. It's only a person like that who can do istiqama. We ask Allah to make us like that. But that is that prominent verse of this surah, which is, has been, had that effect even on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. With all the concerns of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he only had about 20 or so uh, white hairs. Right? And then he says in this hadith that it was actually due to this surah, not even due to the worldly issues, because the tawakkul was so great. When you've got so much tawakkul, there's no stress. Right? And stress is what brings all of this stuff on. And then in verse, another one I want to point out is verse 114. Two ends of the day, establish prayer, and also part of the night. All the good deeds, the good deeds, they will remove your bad deeds. There's a constant washing going on when you do good deeds, especially the prayer. Wasbir. And always the concept of sabr. Be patient. Salat and sabr. Salat and sabr is always mentioned. Then in verse 116 is the discussion about, again, nahi anil munkar. Stop people from doing wrong. Stop people from doing wrong. And one of the reflections, this is all kind of reflections, end of the surah after all those stories mentioned, right, of the five, six prophets. Allah is then saying that from those people of the past, had there been, could there not have been a small amount of people who would have stopped people from the corruption in the world? There wasn't too many people. And that's why a lot of this punishment came, because if there were, then they would not have been so bad. It's when you join the bandwagon with everybody else. May Allah not be guilty of this, uh, not let us be guilty of that crime. And that's why Allah says, وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ لِيُهْلِكَ الْقُرَى This is something to write. And remember for us, verse 117. Allah is not one to destroy a certain area because of an oppression as long as the people they are trying to reform. That's why we need to try to constantly be of those who try to reform ourselves and others. And inshallah, that will keep the punishment away even though there's evil people around. That's why I really put this verse down, right, uh, uh, in your notebooks, 117, very, very important. And Allah finally gives the reason of Telling us these stories in verse 120. Why are we telling you these stories? One is to obviously for people to reflect on. We tell you these stories of the prophets, but uh, the, the reason is to strengthen your heart. We strengthen your heart with them because when you know, oh, okay, that's fine. It's happened to us, but it makes a big difference to me. You know, when you get a certain attack or somebody does something crazy and all the eyes come on to Muslims and you feel like, oh man, you know, now what? Uh, and then you read some of this and you think, okay, as long as I keep trying my best for the sake of Allah, then I'm going to be successful in terms of Allah in the hereafter. وَجَاءَكَ فِي هَذِهِ الْحَقِّ وَمَوْعِذَةٌ وَذِكْرَى لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ And for you in this has come the truth and advice and counsel and a reminder for the believers. Then finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He ends this verse, hundred and, uh, this chapter, 123 verse وَلِلَّهِ غَيْبُ For Allah is the unseen Everything unseen of the heavens and the earth And every matter returns to Him فَعْبُدْهُ Worship Him وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَيْهِ Just rely on Him Just rely on Him And your, your Lord is not unaware of what you do And by that We End this surah and we begin Surat Yusuf. Now a lot of Surat Yusuf we can discuss inshallah tomorrow. But we at least begin the Surah Yusuf here. Quite a few verses of Surat Yusuf in this chapter before the 13th chapter begins. There's 52 verses of Surah Yusuf in the 12th Jews. Now Surah Yusuf is a Makki Surah as well. It doesn't have too many commands like direct commands. It's got... A lot of commands that you can derive from there, but no direct commands. Because it's a story, and there's a lot to be learned from this story. It's a, it has 111 verses. 
It's a relatively large surah. And it has 12 sections, 12 thematic sections. And because it's called, because it has the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, that's why it's called Surat Yusuf. The previous surah had many stories of five or six prophets, but it was called Surat Hud because that's where the prominent story of Surat Hud is mentioned. They decided to call it Surat Hud there. But here is Surah Yusuf exclusively. It's about Yusuf alayhi salam. And literally it's a narrative. Unlike the other stories of the Quran, which are repeated throughout, with bits of information added in other places, or a different way of telling them. Wording is different. No two places are the same. فَأَرْسِلْ مَعِيَ بَنِي Sorry, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبْعَثْ فِي الْمَدَائِنِ حَاشِرِينَ وَأَرْسِلْ فِي الْمَدَائِنِ So, constantly there's wording changes when talking about Musa and Pharaoh's story. There are additional points, additional guidances, additional lessons. So they're not never the two stories the same, right? There's always a bit different. And the point is that if it doesn't affect you here, when you read it here, you may be in a moment, in an emotional state when you read it in the next juz or in, uh, you know, in the next instance and that will affect you there. So that's the purpose, not to just, uh, you're never going to go back to that story again. No, you, as you read through the Quran, you're going to come up with those very important lessons from these stories. But with Surah Yusuf, there is no repetition. His story, while he's mentioned in other places, in a few other places, his story is not repeated in any other place. It's only mentioned here. So, while there's no repetition, right? In the story of Yusuf Ali Islam, it's only here. There's repetition in other people's stories. Uh, I've already explained to you the benefits of that, right? That it has its own style. The, uh, the Quran has its own style. With Surah Yusuf, though, it's literally a story in order. So, it starts off from his young age and the dream and then, and, and it goes right in order. There, there's no movement from here or there. It's in one order until finally his parents eventually come to Egypt. And, um, you know, that becomes, that, that links up with the beginning of the surah. That becomes a realization of the dream that was seen at the beginning by him at a young age. And then after that, at the end, there's a few, uh, from Yusuf Ali Islam himself, there's a few reflections of his, Right? Uh, there's a few reflections of his and then after that there's like just a summary of some of the purposes or whatever by, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, telling us um, why these stories are told and these, uh, th th these nations have passed and so on. Now, <clears throat> Surah Yusuf, it says, نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ بِمَا أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ وَإِن كُنْتَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ We're going to tell you the best of stories, the most excellent of stories. How is, the, how is Surah Yusuf the most excellent of stories? For many, many reasons. It is full of so many different aspects to benefit us. Right? So where it has lessons, it has advices, Probably no other single story has so many things all in one place. No other story in the Quran has so many things all in one place. So, it's so comprehensive, right, that it discusses the following. You can look for these because we're not going to go into detail here. And one of the things about Surah Yusuf is that there's no point going into detail in the entire story because most people, down to the children, know the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. It's a biblical story, except that in the, in the, the biblical version he had a a special coat, and that's what people are jealous about, right? Whereas in the Quran, it's a, it's a different thing, and we'll, I'll explain that. But anyway, these are all the different contrasting ideas that are found in Surah Yusuf, that inshallah, if you write down, you're going to look for them when you read it for yourself, inshallah. So, in there you find discussion of the deen, also the dunya. You find the discussion of tawheed, oneness of Allah, the fiqh, and, and, and uh, you find different uh, jurisprudence in there, right? You find... A seerah in there of the Prophet, you find a biography in there. You find a discussion on dreams, subhanAllah, right? You find politics, you find um, uh, command and rule. There's, uh, uh, there's significations towards that. Then there's a lot of emotion in there. Like if you want an emotional story, the emotions of uh, Yusuf Ali Salam and uh, the, the Aziz Potiphar's uh, uh, wife and so on. There's a lot of emotional ideas in there. There is discussion of uh, 
the social scene, there's discussion of wealth, there's discussion of, uh, of um, uh, uh, difficulty, of, of drought, there's, there's beauty discussed in there, he's got aesthetics, there's beauty, Yusuf Ali Sam being the most beautiful, people falling for him, uh, there's the discussion of love and ishq, right? You know, people, uh, th th there's that di discussion, there's the discussion of uh, abstinence from the world, of taqwa, prophets, um, righteous people, uh, shaitan is mentioned in there, uh, humans are obviously mentioned, animal mentioned in there, uh, vegetation, uh, leaders, kings, business people are mentioned in there, those traders who picked him up and sold him, uh, the, the, the knowledgeable ones, the ignorant ones, you know, that kind of a idea is there. Subhanallah, then it's got discussions of the, the women folk, right, a certain mindset from the w women folk, their discussions between themselves, um, and, you know, being impressed by, by, by beauty and all of that. There's also the discussion in there of just wanting to go into isolation, uh, to be not known. There's obviously the discussion of being, becoming well-known, becoming a stranger, uh, being banished from your city, uh, uh, what do you call it, having to leave. Uh, there's wealth, honor, uh, sabr, patience, um, firmness, and desire. So all of these emotions are in there. And you know why, again, another reason why it's Ahsan al-Qasas. Quran could mean so many things. Allah could mean so many things by Ahsan al-Qasas. When is that from that literary perspective as we just explained? He's got everything that makes a good story. Everything. Constant movement. So many things. Right? But also another thing is that it provides a really good parallel to the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself, in fact. Because there's a number of uh, parallels with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, number one... While it was the brothers of Yusuf Alisan that had jealousy, for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was his Qurashi brothers, right? That they had problems with, including his uncle and so on, right? Then, just as he had to leave, uh, Yusuf Alaihi Wasallam had to leave and go to another area, right? Likewise, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to leave. Like he had to stay in the well, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stayed in Ghar Thawr, right? To hide. Allahu Akbar, he had to go to Medina Munawwara and Yusuf Ali Islam had to go through difficulties there before he became the leader. He had to stay in prison for seven years or whatever and then he became, mashallah, the commander, the leader, or, or actually not commander, but the one in charge of the, the, uh, the, the food and distribution, other affairs. The Prophet Sallallahu also had to go through a lot of suffering until he had the conquest of Mecca and he got, what he, uh, you know, he got the leadership there. And then, subhanAllah, another parallel is just the way when the same people who had thrown Yusuf Ali Salam out and did what they did, they are then identified and they identify him and he lets them go. لا تثريب عليكم اليوم يغفر الله لكم And the Prophet Sallallahu does the same thing afterwards. In fact, he remembers Yusuf Ali Salam after the conquest of Mecca where they say, what are you going to do to us? He says, well, I'm going to do exactly what my brother Yusuf did with his brothers. Go, antum tulaqa you're freed today. You're, you know, you're freed today. Nothing upon you. So there's a lot of similarities. As I mentioned, there's no real need to go into the story in depth because if you just read the translation, you'll get the story. Of course, there's uh, lots of good books written on the juicy additional details, a lot from Israel, Israelite sources that give you a lot of the additional details and a lot of analysis, right? You can find them in other books. I think uh, one of our teachers, Maulana Abdurrahim, has a book on uh, the tafsir of Surah Yusuf. It's one of his first books actually on that. And uh, that has a lot of, mashallah, good. It's based on a tafsir. It's got a lot of good information on there. Right? For the English-speaking uh, people, they can look that. And of course, if you look into the tafsirs or uh, for, the, for the Arabic uh, understanding people, they can look in Qasas al-Anbiya or uh, Qasas al nabiyin Ibn Kathir's work. Lots of discussion in there, lots of additional idea. One of the most comprehensive books on the stories of the prophets was written in Urdu, right? Taken from different sources and Ibn Kathir, etc. is by Hifdur, Maulana Hifdur Rahman Suharwi, right? Called uh, Qasas al-Qur'an. Right? Unfortunately, there is an English translation that's not that good. Somebody could do a really good job on that. He takes from biblical sources, he does a lot of analysis, a little reconciliation, and it's a really good, really detailed work. So essentially, just to kind of talk, uh, just, just to give a summary, right? just to refresh people's minds about the story here. The story starts off with Yaqub, he had 12 children. Right? Mashallah, he had 12 children. Yusuf, 
was extremely handsome. Like he just had this husn, just basically face turning, just very attractive, right? And they say that, you know, he had amazing husn, right? Which continues to feature. Uh, number two, uh, not just that, he, it looks like his behavior was really good as well. And he was one of the youngest, him and his brother, Binyamin, from a different mother, different wife of Yaqub, they were the youngest. And uh, so he was not just beloved for, you know, he's beloved for multiple reasons. Uh, the, apparently there's this idea that the youngest child is the most beloved always, until they grow up. So your oldest child will be the most beloved until the next one comes along and so on. There's always that part of it. But then sometimes an older child will also remain more beloved if they've got certain qualities. In Kai. Sajib, how if you are children out there of parents, which we all are, right, then there is a way that you can, even, you can still become more beloved even if you're the oldest child. Anyway, apparently his mother had passed away as well. That could be another reason why there was a lot of love focused on there. And uh, of course, there's the natural inclination towards the youngest. So Hassan, for example, Hassan radiallahu anhu, uh, the Prophet's grandson, uh, he was asked, his, 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 his daughter was actually asked, that which of your children do you love the most? So the response they gave was, the youngest one until they grow older, the absent one until he comes back, and the sick one until they get better. It's very interesting. It's just emotion, human emotion. If your, one of your children gets sick, then your, all your attention is going to go there until they get better, then they become like everybody else. Others might get jealous in that case, right? And so on. So anyway, but because of that, this caused an issue. And of course, he's destined to be a prophet among all of his brothers, right? Out of all of his brothers. So he sees a dream. And dreams, mashallah. So the emphasis of dreams at the beginning, he sees a dream, tells his father about the dream. Father says, make sure you don't tell because his father knows. Right? So he says, don't tell the dream to your brother. Anyway, the story is that they were jealous of him and eventually they saw that if they want more love to be directed at them, they must get rid of Yusuf alayhi salam. So then they say, okay, let's just kill him. But mashallah, one of them, one of the brothers said, no, don't kill him. Let's just throw him into a well or something. Somebody will pick him up. We'll, we, you know, we won't have to worry about that. And lots of story, then the whole story of... Uh, them coming back, making an excuse, bringing the blood of a, a sheep or something on, on his clothing, saying that we went running, he was looking after our stuff. Eventually, mashallah, wajaat sayyara, right? There was a caravan of traders passing by. They went for water. They pulled out Yusuf alayhi salam. Mashallah, how Yusuf alayhi salam would have even survived the fall into the, into the thing is, there's stories about how Jibreel alayhi salam swooped down and, and basically saved him. There's lots of additional stories which we don't have time to go into. But anyway, he gets eventually taken to Egypt, which is going to be the place where he's going to shine, right? And which, mashallah, all the Egyptians today, as soon as you enter the city, enter the country at the customs, it's, uh, it's, it's there about uh, the verse which says, uh, when, when Actually, no. فلما دخلوا على آوى إليه أبويه وقال ادخلوا مصر إن شاء الله آمنين. ما شاء الله. The Egyptians are very proud of that, right? Of that of that heritage of theirs. Anyway, so the point is now that uh, this uh, trade caravan takes him to Egypt, sells him, and he's bought by the Aziz of Misr. Right? He's not the king, but he's the Aziz of Misr. And there he becomes older. When he gets older, his, mashallah, his handsomeness just increases multiple, you know, uh, m many fold. And his, the wife of the Aziz becomes infatuated with him, tries to seduce him. And then the whole story that takes place and uh, locks him in a room, tries to seduce him. But he runs towards the door, even though he knows it's locked. I mean, what are you going to do? That's why what we learn from there is that you try to do what you can. So he runs to the door, though he had like, I don't know how many locks on there, mashallah, he opened up, right? And he got out and now uh, they, they, uh, she tore his garment from the back. Now the, she blames him. So the whole story is that this little child now, Allah provides a miracle. A ch little child speaks that, okay, depends on where the kameez is torn from. If it's torn from the front, he's to blame. If it's torn from the back, she's to blame because it means he's running away and she grabs him from the back. Then it turns out obviously that it was torn from the uh, from, from the back. So then, uh, in order to just avoid the controversy and you know, the, the embarrassment and everything, Yusuf was put into the prison. 
Mashallah down there that was a, He was continued doing his da'wah work There he's reforming people it seems And then the, the, the story continues Until the king sees a dream In which he sees these seven uh, Seven corns and, and, and so on The whole discussion is there And he wants a uh, interpretation for it Nobody there is able to provide interpretation This guy, one of the prisoners Who, was, uh, who had had an interaction with Yusuf Ali Salman, Had helped them with their dreams in the prison Now he remembers that Hey, I know somebody in prison So he says, let me go back and talk to him He goes back, Yusuf Ali Salman tells him The meaning of the dream And also tells him what to do right? Because there's going to be seven years of drought That are going to come so he's telling them how to preserve the, 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 the staple foods of the time so that they can benefit from it later. He goes back, mashallah, the king says, yeah, you need to bring him out. But Yusuf says, no, I'm not going to come out yet. I don't want to come out as a favor. I want to come out because I should be exonerated and freed. So he says, go and ask those women that, you know, sl- that basically put this slander. So then mashallah, at that time it became very clear. Al-ana hasas al haq I am the one who actually tried to seduce him And he was actually in the clear And then after that the, the story continues Which inshallah we will look at tomorrow But really when you read it slowly with the, And you, you, you live with the emotion The emotions of Yaakov Alisam crying uh, Wishing for his children to come back Not giving up hope There's just so much amri tawakkaltu And there's so many other things So that inshallah will continue tomorrow But I'll also let you read it Just to quickly summarize Surah Hud Starts off With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Greatness being mentioned And how he's in charge of everything And other dali, dalail and proofs of his oneness Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Provides another challenge of bringing Or provides the challenge of Telling them to provide uh, Bring ten surahs like the Quran or one surah. Then there's the story of Nuh alayhi salam. And you know we've been through that. This is as I said one of the longest coverages of the story of Nuh alayhi salam. Is found here. Even though he's mentioned in so many other places. And his story is mentioned uh, briefly in other places. Uh, then the story of Nuh alayhi salam. Uh, and his issue with the peace of his heart. His child. And how he had to let him go. Uh, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, his wife went as well. His wife was destroyed as well. Then we learn about, uh, in the story of Hud alayhi salam, if you look there, it's about istaghfir. Seek, istigh- uh, seek forgiveness. And inshallah, that, that way you will gain more strength. Both spiritual and physical strength, inshallah. And then we have uh, a discussion of sabr and tawakkul. Again, in Hud alayhi salam's story. What you learn from all of these stories, what we learned is that how much each of these prophets were willing to go, how far they were willing to go for their people. Bending over backwards to accommodate as far as possible, but not you know, beyond their principles. And their compassion and so on, but nothing, nothing worked. Right? And these people, they just didn't learn. Then in Shaib Ali Salams, we understand the economic side of things and fairness. Then, of course, there's the story of Musa Ali Salam and Pharaoh. And then there's the discussions of the day of judgment paradise and hellfire ending of the fortunate and the wretched ones may allah make us of the fortunate ones and then surah hud the the prominent verse in there is of the istiqama verse fastaqim kama umirt and da'wa and sabr is also mentioned there and then we begin the story of yusuf alayhi salam first it talks about gives us a significance of dreams Otherwise, it would not have been mentioned. It was just a random dream of a kid. It would not have been mentioned. It's, uh, it, this is a serious dream, which then shows that it became true as well. And even if a child sees a dream, there's significance we learn from that. There's so many things we can pick up from here. And also, it tells us how Yaqub actually listened carefully to the dream, didn't dismiss it, actually guided Yusuf and said, make sure you don't tell anybody. He valued the dream. So that's why we listen to our children and even their dreams, even if they sound a bit strange sometimes. We listen to them. Right. Um, and then after that we have the discussion of hasad, jealousy and envy uh, of, the, of one's own brothers sometimes right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 90 إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَتَّقِي وَيَصْبِرْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيءُ أَجْرُ الْمُحْسِنِينَ That's going to come later anyway And the discussion of the seduction And how he avoided it And the emotions at that time And his focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then finally, Yusuf Ali Salam being in prison and then eventually being released. And that is what 
ends the chapter and the last uh, line this is so that they know that I did not, you know, without them knowing, I did not betray them. Because Allah does not, uh, uh, basically saying that th those who do, uh, th those who are betrayers, their plots will, will never be successful, will never succeed. Allah will never let them succeed. So that's the way it begins. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for uh, allowing us to, uh, we, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us to read this, to benefit it, to make us the people of the Qur'an. And for making us mu'mineen and now making us people of the Qur'an, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be uh, part of that to, among the people who learn the Qur'an and who teach it. The Prophet ﷺ said that the best of you is the one who learns the Qur'an and teaches it. And subhanAllah, we are all involved in this. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those best of people and allow us to complete the rest of it. May Allah bless the rest of our Ramadan as well and make the remaining days better than the previous, previous days. Wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.